Good morning, everyone. Sorry for that slight delay. We're just getting everyone connected. And welcome to day two of our primary care refresher. For those who I haven't met yet, my name is Rowena Clift. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Western Victoria Primary Health Network. Western Victoria Primary Health Network acknowledges the traditional owners and custodians of the lands on which we live, work and play, the Wadarong, Gulijin, Garabunud, Kiwe Wurong, Peak Wurong, Gunditjimara, Jab Wurong, Wachabulik, Jaja Wurong, Jadwajali, Wagaya, Jadwa, and Yokobuk peoples. We recognise their diversity, resilience, and the ongoing place that First Nations people hold in our communities. We pay our respects to their elders, both past and present and commit to working together in the spirit of mutual understanding, respect and reconciliation. We support self-determinant of First Nations people and their organisations. It's great to see so many of our Western Victorian primary care colleagues turning in for day two of the refresher. I hope you're somewhere warm and cosy because I know it's a bit of a polar blast happening out there. As we move to a situation of COVID normal, is there such a thing? Western Victoria PHN has been delighted to offer this event in a hybrid format this year. It was great to see so many of you yesterday in the Geelong venue, and I hope those that attended in Ballarat and Warrnambool enjoyed the networking and learning face-to-face -face once again. The theme for this year's primary care refresher is the journey of care through a pandemic providing us an opportunity to reflect on our experiences through COVID-19 and to gain new insights as we move forward. The pandemic has generated tremendous challenges for our primary care sector, yet the last two years have also brought to light new opportunities for us to improve and innovate in our sector. The pandemic has demonstrated how intentional investment in primary care can deliver a more interconnected and efficient approach with improved capacity and capability. And we look forward to hearing what the new government has in store around that. Importantly, the journey through COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted how vital primary care and general practice. It's a strong, sustainable health system and its integral role we play in addressing the health needs and driving better health outcomes for our communities. The ever-changing landscape of COVID-19 and its vast and continuing impacts have shown the importance of knowledge sharing. At Westwick PHN, a core part of our work is supporting primary care colleagues to enhance their knowledge base and facilitate professional development. So this weekend is all about learning and networking with your peers to ensure that we are all informed about best practice in primary care. I would like to acknowledge the important contributions of our conference delegates, Western Victoria PHN staff and our conference sponsors for supporting this annual event to ensure a quality educational program is successfully delivered. A note to our sponsors to say a big thank you to our gold sponsors, Ballarat Hospice Care Incorporated, the Australian College of Rural and Remote Medicine, Lake Imaging, Hospice Foundation Geelong, Geelong Head to Health. Our silver sponsors are the Geelong Clinic, Going Rural Health, Grampians Region Palliative Care Consortium, Kubico, Deakin University Western Victoria Regional Training Hub, and the Grampians Weight Specialists. You will see from the program that our refresher consists of two streams, the GP stream covering important topics, primarily for GPs, the primary care stream covering important topics related to GPs, practice managers, practice nurses, practice staff and allied health professionals. I'd also like to thank our conference facilitators. Today we have Dr Anne Stevenson facilitating the GP stream and Matt Dixon facilitating the primary care stream. 
We have some wonderful and prominent speakers today presenting on a variety of engaging topics. I extend a warm welcome to our session presenters and our panel members. If you're after more information on the presenters, please refer to the conference booklet. Lastly, I'd like to take this opportunity to extend my gratitude to you all for your efforts over the last 12 months. And thank you again for joining us today. We look forward to working with you and the incoming government to ensure support for primary care is recognised and acted upon. Great. Thanks, everyone, for your patience this morning. Um, modern technology doesn't always work, so we need to remember that with our patients, I suppose, as well. Um, it gives me great pleasure to say, uh, to introduce again, um, Adjunct Professor Ruth Stewart, the Australian Government Department of Health, National Rural Health Commissioner. I meet with Ruth and normally she's in a singlet and, and I'm going to tell you, she's got a scarf and a big jumper on, so I don't know whether she's further south or whether or not it's actually cold up in Queensland. Ruth, it's great to have you, and I know you're, you have a little passion for Western Victoria due to your time in Camperdown. So over to you, Ruth. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much, and look, thanks for the invitation to talk to you today. Um, so um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Gunai Kurnai people as the traditional custodians of the land on which I stand today. So, yes, I'm a long way south from my uh home and I'm finding it pretty cold here in Gippsland where I am. Um, I also want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of all the lands where we meet virtually. I pay my respect to the elders of these lands, past, present and emerging, and I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are here with us today. Today's presentation, I'm going to talk to you about the work of the Office of the National Rural Health Commissioner, about COVID-19, what we've learned during this pandemic. We'll have a bit of a spin through national rural policy, current areas of focus, looking at rural generalism in general practice, allied health and nursing, multidisciplinary teams, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Workforce Plan and Innovative Models of Care. Um, and finish off with the Rural Health Policy Vision, as we see it within the Office of the National Rural Health Commissioner. So, um, I'm sorry, because we're not doing this in presentation mode, um, I normally have uh, this all happening with uh, animation, but you're just getting a whole lot Bang. Anyway, um, my role is to support urgent and emerging issues, to support um, innovative models of care. Now, the urgent and emerging issues, obviously COVID-19 has been a major one of those. Um, and um, I started my term um, in June uh, sorry, 1st of July 2020, and we were well into the um, the first wave um, of COVID and the lockdowns. And I've been supporting uh, the National um, Leaders Network for the Rural and Remote G General Practice Respiratory Clinic. Um, so I chair a committee um, that brings together the leaders of the rural GPRCs and that enables us to um, quickly, very quickly escalate issues that are found at uh, grassroots level within the GPRCs um, to the highest levels within the Department of Health and we can get pretty rapid response. Um, I suppose my office adds not just the ease of access but also um, some authority so that uh, our, the voice is heard. I've been uh, called upon within the statement of expectations that um, you can could all find if you wanted to on the internet. Um, it's a formal letter to me from the Minister for Regional Health called on to support innovative models of care 
um, there's pretty strong agreement around Australia that one of the reasons why we have poor health outcomes in rural and remote Australia and the, why we have such difficulty attracting clinicians to rural and remote areas, one of the reasons is that the models of care that we are currently using just don't really work. Um, and so the federal government is putting quite a bit of work into um, giving grants for groups that are developing innovative models. And when the innovative model of care has been developed, there's also um, other grants for supporting um, the implementation of those models of care. Now, I'm just going to move this around a bit because really I say another focus is rural workforce and training and primary care reform, but I tend to include that within the grab bag of rural generalism. Rural generalism in medicine, rural generalism in nursing, which um, is being the, the referred to now as rural and remote nursing generalism and rural journalism in allied health. And finally, a lot of my work um, comes about because of the stakeholder engagement that I'm called upon uh, to enact. So um, meeting with people from you know, every corner of the country with key stakeholders, with community groups, talking rural health. So I have two deputy commissioners who were appointed um, in 2021. They are Faye McMillan, you can see on the left there. Faye is a Wiradjuri Yina, um, as such, is the, was the first Aboriginal pharmacist in Australia. She now works with the University of New South Wales, um, leading um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island uh, education um, and she has um, deep links into allied health across Australia. So she is the Deputy Rural Health Commissioner for um, allied health and Indigenous health. And on the right there in that picture you can see Shelley Nolan. Shelley is um, the Deputy National Rural Health Commissioner for Nursing and Midwifery. Um, Shelley's other gig, uh, other uh, job is as Chief Nurse and Midwifery Officer for Queensland. And she brings a huge amount of experience in, um, in rural and remote nursing and midwifery management, as well as personal clinical experience. So, the, these two wonderful women um, support me in meeting the goals that are set within the statement of expectations, providing their expert advice um, from their disciplines so that um, we make sure that my office is not just focused on medicine, which is a bit of a temptation when you've got a doctor in the role. Um, but with, um, with my whole office, um, and particularly with the um, deputy commissioners, we have a much more rounded approach to the healthcare team. And um, Faye and Shelley engage with, uh, with the rural and regional and remote stakeholder groups within their discipline. And so really extend our engagement, which is a great thing. So my team, um, summarizes this, uh, that we represent, we engage, so we represent um, rural to uh, rural and remote areas to Canberra and the, uh, to the Department of Health in Canberra and to government. But we also bring back views and commentary from Canberra to rural and remote communities. We engage we meet with, we talk, we sit down, we yarn with um, key stakeholders and community groups. We actively pursue 
different topics. We don't wait for issues to be brought to us or, or to be instructed to act on something. We hear about things and engage with that concept. We challenge. Why is it so? Why? How, how could we improve this? And we highlight the issues. So that makes a very nice little acronym, REACH. We reach into communities and enable rural communities to reach and influence Australian health policy. COVID, what have we learnt? Well, um, pre-pandemic, we already knew that there were challenges in attracting and retaining rural healthcare professionals. Um, there were pretty regular um, media reports about the difficulty of attracting doctors and um, allied health practitioners and nurses into rural and remote communities. But then COVID-19 pandemic began and border closures happened, lockdowns happened, and the workforce that we, it, it, we really had taken our eye off the ball. We hadn't realised how much of the rural and remote workforce had been provided by locum doctors and agency nurses travelling in and out. Um, and even where there were regular connections between some remote and rural communities with specific clinicians, how many of those clinicians actually fly in, fly out to that community where they work? And so when border restrictions were imposed, um, that, uh, that mobile workforce stayed home and created huge issues for um, rural and particularly remote um, Australian communities. So it was a really stark message about the, the vulnerabilities of the rural and remote health workforce. But we also began to learn about the strengths, the way that um, the flexibility of uh, rural and remote workforce um, meant that the function um, that was required within a health service was quite often provided by clinicians doing work that wasn't in their wasn't in their lane as as people might say but that by swapping lanes they were actually had the skills to provide a service such as um, such as maternal and child health nurses who vaccinate children actually can vaccinate anyone um, uh, allied health practitioners who are used to assessing patients within the allied health context actually um, can do a pretty good job in assessing and triaging um, in a COVID clinic so that the nurses and doctors can get on with doing the work to actually treat and manage um, those people who enter the, um, the clinic and the hospital. Um, I can go on for quite a long time about those examples, and I'm happy to do so later if you're interested in them. But look, the bottom, bottom line in this message is that we are stronger together. Multidisciplinary teams really add a lot of resilience and mutual support. Um, and when you have a multidisciplinary team of rural generals, people who are working to their scope, top of their scope in their particular profession, you can be quite responsive um, whilst still providing high quality care. So multidisciplinary teams. Um, I'm finding that people talk about multidisciplinary teams quite a bit, but we don't as yet really have strong um, agreement on what a multidisciplinary team is. Um, I'll talk bit later about uh, the fact that we will be running a summit in Cairns at the end of this month on exactly that. Um, rural generalists working in multidisciplinary teams, what are they, what can they provide and what, what does it mean? So a multidisciplinary team can include, for example, general practitioners, um, Aboriginal health workers and practitioners, allied health professionals, nurses, midwives, 
other doctors such as rural generalists and visiting specialists, and I acknowledge that GPs include rural generalists. Um, and working as a team, you can deliver comprehensive and appropriate care to communities. If you're just focused on, uh, we have a clinic here and we need nurses to deliver this clinic, and the agency nurses are no longer coming, you can grind to a halt. But if you say we have a team here and different members of our team have different skills that they will contribute to the work of the team, you can be far more flexible and responsive to, to uh, whatever life throws at your team. So multidisciplinary teams should address the health needs of local communities and work in co-designed models of care. So um, not just decide in their professional wisdom what this community needs, ask the community what they want for their health care and negotiate. So co-design, negotiate what is appropriate um, for a service in this context and, and how to make it accessible to the local community. Rural generalists of all sorts, of all professions, are most effective in multidisciplinary teams. Yes, a rural generalist, by definition, works to the top of scope, broader scope. But if they're working with a team of other professionals who are likewise working to top of scope, broadest scope, um, you are much more likely to provide a really very comprehensive um, scope of uh, services. So um, one of the things that, uh, one of the headlines of um, my uh, statement of expectations is that I should implement the National Rural Generalist Pathway, which is the medical National Rural Generalist Pathway. It's a medical, dedicated medical training pathway to attract, retain and support rural generalist doctors um, and uh, the, within the development of the National Rural Generalist Pathway, we are seeking recognition of rural generalism as a specialised field within the specialty of general practice. Now, I do wish it was as easy as saying, hey, guys, uh, rural generalism is just a specialised field. Uh, no, there is a um, very formal application process to the Medical Board of Australia um, and the Australian Medical Council to um, request recognition of any specialty um, and um, likewise of specialised fields within specialties. So that process has been underway now for 18 months, no, probably actually coming up to two years. We there. It's a two-stage process. We are now in stage two. We've had the exciting um, acknowledgement that uh, we, the Office of Best Practice Regulation, doesn't need a regulation impact statement. Um, I can sense that I'm becoming a bit detailed, but if you've had two years of working in this space like I have, that's very exciting. Just believe me, it is. Um, we're seeking national consistency uh, with the potential for local application. So we're not saying uh, the Rural Generals Pathway in the Northern Territory has to be exactly the same as that in Tasmania, but we want to know that a Rural Generals trained in Tasmania can work in the Northern Territory and can transfer their um, accreditation um, to uh, and their credentials will be recognised um, seamlessly in the Northern Territory. And we want a clear training pathway. So a kid in high school in nil can say, I want to be a doctor like these doctors in town and, oh, here we go. Here is the training pathway. This, these are the steps that I need to undertake to become a rural generalist doctor. So why is it important? Uh, we know that when you train doctors with the broadest scope 
uh, to the broader scope of practice with a broader set of skills um, that include um, both comprehensive primary care, emergency care, um, and other medical specialist care that they can work with in rural hospital inpatient um, care and in co the community. Um, we know that when you, um, that doctors with those qualifications, such as the fellowship of the Australian College of Rural and Remote Medicine, um, when uh, ACRAM publishes their outcomes um, data for FACRAMs, and we know that 87% of them are working in Rama's three to seven, so small um, rural communities. That's pretty impressive. So lots of people say, "Oh, this is a wicked problem. We, you know, where where we can't work out how to provide a medical workforce for rural Australia." That's wrong. Actually, we know how to do it. We're just not doing it enough. Um, I referred to the retention um, statistics for the fellowship of the Australian College of Rural and Remote Medicine, um, the retention statistics for the Royal Australian College of General Practitioner Rural Generalist Stream um, are not currently available, so I'm, I'm unable to quote them. Now, um, sorry, I'm just having a moment here of grieving at the absence of my uh, animation, so you see all this all at once. But... Um, on the right there, you see the um, the uh, cover of the report by my predecessor in this role, the Emeritus Professor Paul Worley, who, who presented to government, uh, specifically to the Minister for Regional Health, two reports. One of them was the report from the Task Force for the National Rural Generals Pathway, and the other one was this one. Report to the Minister for Regional Health, um, etc., on the improvement of access, quality, and distribution of allied health services in regional, rural, and remote Australia. So basically, improving rural and remote allied health services across Australia. There were four recommendations from that uh, report, and all of them are underway. Some of them are actually complete. So recommendation one, that there should be um, that there should be a solid program established of service and learning consortia. So service and learning consortia are where students learn as they're providing a service. And there are a number of examples of, of these across the state. Um, my office, in conjunction with the um, with the Chief Allied Health Officer for Australia, have run a uh, workshop um, discussing what's needed to establish a service and learning consortia. And I know that there's a lot of interest and much more activity in establishing these service and learning consortia. The, in the um, last budget, the um, federal government funded uh, another three university departments of rural health University Departments of Rural Health are working closely with um, the government to, um, to establish service and learning consortia. Recommendation two, that there should be investment in culturally safe and culturally responsive workforce. Now, that is all about increasing the number of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, people who become allied health practitioners. The... Um, Indigenous Allied Health Australia um, is running a program that uh, is increasing. It's placed in a couple of centres around Australia, including the Northern Territory and the Kimberley, where they support um, and uh, encourage, or encourage and support um, Indigenous students into allied health training and support them into their early career and it's having great success. Recommendation three, uh, that there we should start to um, collect a national database on allied health workforce. And that's incredibly complex, but um, their steps are underway, including 
uh, what I'll refer to as NAGOT, um, the National Allied Health Graduate Outcome um, T. I can't remember what the T stands for, but it's... Thank you. And there's also um, Recommendation 4, um, Anne-Marie Anne -Marie Boxall has been appointed as a Chief Allied Health Officer. So we have a vision for rural allied health, that there should be workforce po policies providing training and support, that there should be development of a national allied health workforce strategy, and that there should be expansion of allied health and rural generalist pathways and allied health assistant workforce packages. And the past, the recent, um, the recent budget actually announced expansion of that. We'd like to see greater expansion. And this is that expansion. Allied Health Rural Generals Pathway which, and Allied Health Assistant Workforce Package, which is run by SARA, um, the Symposium of Allied um, Australian Rural and Remote Allied Health, is running this program. Um, there are 90 places dedicated to private practice and community-based allied health service settings, including 30 in Aboriginal community controlled health organisations, and 30 allied health assistant scholarships. There are nine allied health professions that offer rural general scope of practice, and you can see them all there. What's our vision for rural nursing? We want to attract and retain appropriate skilled and well-supported nursing workforce. Um, Shelley Nolan is leading a body of work to develop a national rural and remote nurse generalist framework to manage the future career opportunities for rural nurses, to define what skills are needed for nurses to be um, ready and competent, confident and competent to work in rural and remote. So working to the top of license in nursing. One of the things that we are questioned about with this is, well, all of those things that you're saying um, are, are within the standards for nursing, except the difference is with a rural and remote nurse generalist, um, it's likely that they will be using all of those um, in their day-to-day -day work. So the, that framework will describe a unique context, the unique context of rural and remote area nursing and the provision of comprehensive primary health care in the distinct teams that we find in rural communities, which are small, in the distinct environments, which have small teams. The committee overseeing the development of this framework was established in 2021 and engages and consults with peak professional bodies. We've also um, been working with uh, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Workforce Policy Branch, and we're very pleased to be part of the development of the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Workforce Strategic Framework, which was co-designed with First Nations people and seeks to attract, re recruit and retain workers across all roles at all levels and locations within the health sector. So it's not specifically rural, but it's ta the target is to increase Indigenous employment in the health workforce to 3.43%. You might think that's a random number. It's not. It is the percentage of Indigenous Australian representation within the Australian population. So we want parity. I've mentioned the innovative models of care. They're health models co-designed by local communities and health services. There are two grant opportunities run by uh, the Department of Health. Primary Care Rural um, Innovative Multidisciplinary Models, PRIM, that's to develop models, and then also Innovative Models of Care, which is a grant to implement models that have been developed. Our vision for rural health training is that there should be implementation of, of a national rural generalist pathway, consistent national training program right across the nation, that we should increase rural origin selection and support of um, rural training and placement opportunities. That's a nice picture of the SQRH out in Charleville, which supports training from woe to go of nurses. 
So we want um, we want supported supervision and training of entry and early career rural health workforce. So don't just dump them in a rural community. Supervise and support them. Encourage them to continue. And we want place-based, multidisciplinary rural models of care that are responsive and can be responsive to natural disasters, epidemics, pandemics, health and well-being of rural communities, where there are strong multidisciplinary teams that are local. We have seen um, the, the, the local health service be able to continue high-quality provision of care without the levels of stress that some other um, health services have experienced. Thank you. There we go. Has that been? great? Thanks, Ruth, and thank you um, for your time this morning. I'm just quickly. We haven't got much time because we're due to move into another session at ten o'clock. So um, I just wanted to note that um, Greg has also noted that you were you and your husband were GP obstetricians in Camperdown for twenty two years and. Heavily involved okay. in the Deakin Medical School, the yes. new medical school. So thank you. Um, the PHN does meet with Ruth fairly regularly. So if there was any questions, Ruth, I'm sure you're happy if I bring them to you through that forum. Yes, that would be fine. Right. And All right. Look, well, I'm sorry that tech difficulties uh, messed up the start. But no, all good. It's just wonderful right. to have you and great to have you in Victoria. Stay warm. And um, we'll finish this session and you'll need to move um, out of this session and decide which of the, ne the next sessions you're going to be part of. But please um, enjoy your day. It's a really good um, program and we will talk to you again soon. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.